Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House. It's Sunday morning, January the 10th, 2021. I'd just like to welcome all of you who are uh, tuning in to this broadcast today. For all the people that are attenders of our church, and it's going to be nice when we get together. But uh, there has been an extension in the health order until the beginning of February. So we'll be uh, doing online sessions together until we can meet in the, in the building again. But uh, I'm just grateful that, uh, that we, can, we can open the Word of God. There's some good things for us. I'm continuing my um, series into the book of 1 Peter. My uh, text today is 1 Peter chapter 4, reading from verses 7 to 11. And my message is entitled, Living in the Grace of God. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning as, as we begin? Heavenly Father, thank you for each of the people that are out there. God, you see the needs that are present God, you see those who need encouragement today, who need strengthening, who need um, who just need an extra boost, God, through this difficult time. And, and Father, for those that are joining us for the first time or from outside of our church fellowship, God, I, I just pray, Lord, that you would encourage them as well. If there's those that are listening today that don't know you, I pray that they would understand how much they are loved by you and how you long for them to, to be your children. So I just pray, God, that you would do the work that you had planned to do from the beginning uh, in the power of your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's times in our lives where all of us, to a smaller or maybe even a larger degree, experience pressure to run away from the calling that uh, God has given to us. And when hard times visit us, sometimes we feel justified in our hearts to abandon the post that God has called us to work in because things are difficult. Now, while there's no place in this world that's perfect, difficulties often produce within us a desire for new places where there are fewer problems or fewer conflicts to be faced. And some, a new job, a new town, a new spouse, a new church. The list of things is long, Uh, that we can run to in order to run away from our present troubles. I've become become convinced that there are times in our lives where God allows us to be placed under intense pressure, and he does this to, to aid us in shedding things that need to be laid to rest before we can continue growing into uh, maturity as believers. Now, when bad things come to us, and when we're made to feel uncomfortable. Our compulsion is to flee. But this is precisely the time that God calls us to dig in and stay firmly planted where we are, living in His grace. It is here in the forge of suffering in our souls that our, our, our hearts are melted down. And then we're agitated so that what needs to be purged out of us rises to the surface so that God can scoop it off. During the days of the Apostle Peter, it seemed as though the world of many of the disciples was coming to an end. And indeed, they were not far off in their perceptions. The persecution of the believers in the churches of Asia Minor was significant and it was intensifying. The pressure was on to give in to fear and to flee abandoning both the church and the faith. In our text this morning, in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 7, Peter writes to the believers, saying, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind, so that you may pray. Now, Peter acknowledges to the people that indeed, their time to do the work of the Lord might be short. Through the history books, we, we, learned, we learned that Peter um, and many of his believing companions in these early churches, shortly after this book was written, would endure terrible persecution and in the end be executed for holding to the truth of the gospel. At the time that Peter was writing this letter, all of them were sensing that the winds of change were blowing. Some were being tempted to give into the fear that was overtaking them and to back away 
from what God had directed them to advance towards. And Peter reminds the saints that even though the end of things is near, that fact alone was all the more reason for them to be in tune with the heartbeat of their Savior. I believe that Peter's message is every bit as relevant to us today as those believers in the early church. For instance, if we knew that we only had one week to live, how would we spend our last week? I think that each of us faced with the urgency of such knowledge would sober up and would live in probably a different way than we're even living today. Peter himself, he knew all too well of what it was like to be weak in his flesh. He knew what it was like to be tired and unprepared to face trials. Remember back to the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of the disciples knew what was happening or what was coming, but Jesus knew what was about to happen. He was sober in mind and alert in spirit as to what was happening around him. He knew that he was on the cusp of a culmination of everything that God had brought him to the earth to accomplish, and he knew the suffering that he was about to face would not be easy. Jesus called Peter, James, and John, if you re recollect this event, and he asked them to separate from the other disciples and come with him deeper into the garden to pray with him. And we read in Matthew chapter 16, 38 to 41, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Immediately after saying this to his disciples, Jesus went into the garden again to pray more fervently. And after coming back, he found his disciples sleeping a second time. And it was then that Judas Iscariot and those that were with him came to arrest Jesus and to take him away. Now Peter was not ready to face the tests that he would face. Likely he had sleep still in his eyes. He jumped up out of sync with the will of the Holy Spirit with a sword in his hand to defend Jesus from the, from the betrayer in his flesh. He tried to come against what was threatening the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after picking up the sword, he chopped off the high priest's servant's ear. But he was rebuked from, from doing this by Jesus. And after this, we know the story that Peter ended up denying Christ three times. First of which was a little servant girl who asked him if he had been with Jesus. So much for being... A, mightier war, a mighty warrior on his own steam. Peter had gone into this scenario totally unprepared, half asleep and prayerless. Oh, how the apostle learned from his mistakes. When the time of the end is at hand, it is not a time to be prayerless and sleeping. It is a time to be alert and prayerful, focused on what the Master wants us to be focused on. And Peter was passing on advice to the believers that he had learned by experiencing personal failure and yielding to temptation. Now this seasoned man of God tells the church the chief end and purpose of prayer. The chief end and purpose of prayer is to draw the believer into sync with the will of the Father through the power given through the work of Jesus Christ in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and in praying that they should display their affection for God, and as a result, above all else, they should love one another fervently in the same way that God has fervently shown love to them. 
And Peter encourages the people, saying in verse 8 of our text, Above all else, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Peter calls the believers to love each other with the defined love that is written about by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He realizes that with the imperfection of people that in the struggle that life brings, everyone is working through different issues, having to continue to surrender rogue attitudes that come from the flesh, which are contrary to the will of the Holy Spirit. I wish we could say that we will act perfectly in every scenario. We should all strive to live in a way that honors God and should be growing towards being perfected in Christ. But the reality is that each of us has a capacity to fail one another and to fail in our efforts to serve God wholeheartedly. And as a result, because we still have a sin nature that we wrestle with, we fall short at times. Have you ever decided in the morning that you want to follow and walk in obedience to God that whole day? You pray to that end and you begin to walk toward that end, but by the end of the day you've encountered a situation where you were tested and you took your eyes off of Jesus. It doesn't take long for us to make bad decisions, does it? Even for a moment, or maybe even more than a moment, and before you know it, we're off the rails and we've sunk below the waves. Our flesh has got the best of us and we sin, causing offense to God and to one another. When we fall and we sin against God, because of His grace though, He freely forgives us and He restores us. God loves us so much. When we decide to live in His grace, we find strength in relationship with Him. And this turns our hearts and makes us want to run away from sin and embrace holiness. And this is why Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. God calls us to have the same sort of love for other people, my friends, who are walking in the pathway next to us as God has for us giving them grace, encouraging them when they fall. And, and this is why Peter is saying here, he encourages the believers to love one another deeply, or fervently. That is to say, take loving your brother or sister in Christ seriously, soberly, agape love, the love that comes from God leads to true wisdom in living. And the opposite of agape love coming from the Lord is selfishness, born in the heart of the flesh. And I like how the Berean study Bible describes the contrasting attitudes of the person yielded to the will of the Holy Spirit, Spirit versus the person who is permitting their sin-laden flesh to take the lead. Now each of us have choices and these choices bear different fruit as written in James chapter 3 17 to 19 in the Berean translation where James says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every sort of evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure then peace-loving, gentle, accommodating, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap the fruit of righteousness. You see, Peter gets practical with the saints on how they ought to carry themselves in the spirit of deep agape love for each other when he encourages the believers in verses 9 and 10 of our text, saying, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards 
of God's grace in its various forms. There is an attitude that has come forward from many North American believers. I believe that God is calling us to rid ourselves collectively of this attitude and to turf it out the door of our spiritual houses. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants this attitude to be excised from our being. Now I believe there's different ways this attitude manifests. And it manifests with a diversity of different issues. But the embraced attitude that needs to go is something like this. I have my liberty in Jesus. I will do what I want to do and I don't care what you think about it. When we look at that attitude through the lens of the Word of God, through the instructions given to us by our Savior and by the Apostles, my friends, this is an attitude that is not pleasing to the Lord. Unfortunately, it permeates the North American church. But it is, in reality, self-centered and is actually anti-Christ. It's total opposite to what Jesus Christ calls us to embrace. Nowhere in scriptures are we taught to disregard others on how we decide to live our own lives. Jesus called us to be careful of the things we do as believers, especially those of us who are leaders of the church, lest we become a stumbling block to other believers. In Matthew 17, 24-27, Jesus taught that we should go out of our way to make sure we don't unnecessarily offend those around us by our actions. In 24, we read, After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, they replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked? From who do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Brothers and sisters, the word of God, which is our authority, implores true believers in Jesus to have a like-mindedness to Christ and to avoid doing things, even if they aren't wrong in and of themselves, if doing them will make someone stumble. 1 Corinthians 8.9 says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. True believers in Jesus Christ must ensure that they live honorably in the sight of all men. Romans 12.17 instructs us, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. True believers in Jesus need to ask themselves if what they are doing brings glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10.31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The bottom line is that true disciples of Christ, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, should ensure that they don't knowingly put an obstacle in anyone's way. 
the Apostle Paul says in this passage. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. It is time, my friends, for us as believers to lay aside our own interests for the interests of others and to serve God and others with the gifts that God has so graciously given given to us as faithful stewards of His grace in its various forms. And this is what Peter is encouraging his readers to do. This week, I was humbled and encouraged by a saint of God in our fellowship who is always in the habit of reaching out to others with practical service. Her care and concern for other people practically was so good to see. Her proactive concern in reaching out to others was done with such a subtle, humble demeanor. And I thank that person. And they told me that God had given them so much blessing that they needed to obey God by blessing other people with the strength and resources and giftings that God had blessed them with. Friends at Hillside, this is what characterizes a Christian who is living in sync with the Holy Spirit. The gifts that God has given us are, are many. Not every one of us can speak, but those of us who have this gift should speak as though they are speaking the very words of God. Some of us can knit quilts. Not all of us can knit quilts. <laughs> That's me for sure. But those who can, can do this for the glory of God to encourage others. Some of us are encouragers. Some of us have the knack of stepping in when people are feeling their worst and lifting their spirits. A phone call, a text, just a special word. Some of us are giving gifts to others who are in need. Some of us have strong arms and backs and can serve others by being generous with those gifts. Some have the ability to bless others financially as God has blessed them. Some can sing while others can't hold a tune in a bucket. Not every one of us has the same gifts. The gifts are diverse. But we can use the gifts that God has given us to bring Him glory. And what brings Him glory is when we love Him and we love our neighbors as ourselves. I'm glad, I'm so glad and excited when I see the Lord working through His saints as they love one another in practical ways. As your pastor, there's nothing more joyful than to see this occurring in our midst. I see people serving Jesus with whatever God has given them to serve Him. And friends, like the Apostle Peter, encouraged his contemporaries. I want to encourage you not to get weary in doing the good that God has called you to do. He's given you these gifts to pour out in service to Him. And that brings Him glory. And this is what the Apostle Paul is also speaking about in Galatians chapter 6, the second half of verse 8 to verse 10, when he says, The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, God does not promise that our lives are going to be easy, troubleless, filled with sunshine and rainbows. 
We need to understand that God wants us to learn to trust in Him to carry us through regardless of the state of the world's environment around us. He wants us to be steadfast in our character and to do good even when we are surrounded by evil and evildoers. He wants us to shine like bright stars in the universe with the light of heaven shining through us as we hold out the word of life in both word and in deed. In agreement with the Apostle Paul, Peter continues saying in verse 11, If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. In other words, as a Christian, God wants us to keep a tight rein on our tongue and let the words come out of our lips reflecting the principles that we live by through the Word of God. Salt water need not come out of a freshwater spring. If it does, there needs to be some soul searching to find out why this is. And we need to spend some serious time before the Lord in prayer, asking Him to purge us of this attitude. The Bible teaches us in James chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue as a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praises and cursing my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? Oh, no human being can tame his own tongue. But the believer who trusts in the Lord is given the strength of the Spirit to overcome what is naturally impossible. Life in the Spirit enables us to speak as though we are speaking the very words of God. This is pure, practical power for living, given to the believers in Jesus by His Holy Spirit. It is possible for us to be a fresh spring of water in a salty world. Isn't it salty out there? Bring freshness into the world as the Spirit enables you to speak, as the Spirit enables you to act with the gifts that God has given you, even if they aren't the gift of speaking, but the gift of service or different kinds of gifts that are out there. Be the fresh water that God calls you to be. Godly words and godly actions bring glory to God and praise to our our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are fully functioning and yielded to the Holy Spirit, our words and our practical interactions with the world around us will be pure, upright, and holy. And that glorifies our Lord. It's time for the church to rise to the occasion. The darkness is trampling all around us, but we don't have to be trampled asunder by the darkness. We can rise and shine. Shine, church. Take the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit and be the church that God has called you to be. Rise and praise your Father through your actions, through your attitudes, through your motives. And whatever you do, give glory to God. And He will bless you and He will be with you. Greater is He that is in you, my friends, as believers, than He that is in the world. God is calling us to be alert and self-controlled Because the end is near. Jesus is coming so soon. We don't know when His day is coming. But He's calling us in this hour to love one another deeply, to serve one another's interests above our own, 
Today, the Lord calls us to be hospitable and patient with each other, to serve one another joyfully, and to be fervently working in the gifts that God has given to each of us in this life. To be careful how we live and not to be a stumbling block to others. May our attitudes and our actions be a beacon of light in this dark world so that salvation, deliverance, and healing will come to the people who desperately, desperately need to experience the wonderful salvation of our Almighty God just as we have experienced and tasted and seen that the Lord, He is good. My prayer this morning is that we will faithfully administer God's grace in its various forms through our lives both individually and collectively as a church with all of the glory going to Jesus. Would you rise with me, my brothers and sisters, as we go together, let's shine in this dark time. Don't be discouraged. Don't allow the enemy to divert you away from your calling to serve the Lord and distribute His grace in its various forms. For together, in harmony with the Holy Spirit, we're unstoppable and we are strong. Let's start 2021 outright and serve the Lord fervently with all that is in us. Let us bless His holy name. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for Your mercy. We thank You for the strength that You provide to Your saints, God, to rise above the darkness and to shine as beacons of light as we hold out the gospel for those that need it most. All of us, Lord, have experienced Your grace. Those that are walking around stumbling, not knowing their right hand from their left. They need to know the truth that will set them free. God, would you work through us. May we be faithful ambassadors of your message. Collectively as a church, God, help us to work together even when people are discouraged because we're not able to meet regularly. God, I pray that prayer warriors would rise. That you would give people ideas on how they might go about sharing the gospel in the gift that you've given them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I pray that you have a wonderful week. Take care.